All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, for those of you that are on time, let's not wait any longer. Um, some more people will join us. At the same time, we are also live on Facebook, so we have people uh, following us there as well. So welcome to people on Facebook. Welcome for people uh, here in the Zoom meeting. Um, we're very pleased that you're joining us here tonight for uh, the event on consensual debating. Um, let me quickly introduce myself. So my name is Thomas de Weer. I'm um, the program coordinator at Stam Europa. Um, Stam Europa itself needs a little bit of explanation. Stam Europa is a, a new democratic space uh, in the center of Brussels. Um, it it's actually based in a physical space. It's a building that has been abandoned for almost 15 years. Um, and in the middle of this European neighborhood, this was an opportunity we saw to open up this abandoned building and to create a participatory informal space. Uh, we hope to launch in, um, in, in September and we have a, a first few events already going on. Um, what is very important for us is, is dialogue, participation on European topics. Um, and that's why we were so happy when uh, Tony Czarnetsky uh, contacted us. Uh, he joined us for another event and he came uh, to us a few weeks ago with a, with a very interesting proposal. Uh, he explained to us, like, look, um, we um, at Sustensis, uh, we built uh, Euro Agora. Um, and at Euro Agora, we have this innovative method of consensual uh, debating. I will let him explain more about that later on. Um, but this we found very interesting because we at Stam Europa, we find uh, innovation very important. Um, we, we think that, I mean, if we talk about dialogue, if we talk about debate, uh, let's do it in an innovative way. Let's do it in a way uh, to make it uh, constructive, uh, to find solutions. Um, and, and that's why we are so happy that we had this, uh, this proposal from, from Tony. Um, a few words about, uh, about Sustensis, because Tony Czarnetsky is part of this organization, um, uh, Sustensis. It's a think tank uh, on humanity's transition to coexistence with superintelligence. Um, so that's also where this method comes from. It's, it's really this focus on artificial intelligence on tomorrow's democracy, the tomorrow's democracy that we want to build together. Um, and when we link it with what's going on in Europe at this point, uh, in Europe, we have the conference on the future of Europe, which is uh, already underway since, since a couple of weeks, even months. Um, and, and we believe this is a great opportunity if we do it well. Um, so we want to link these both teams, like the innovative element of consensual uh, debating and the conference on the future of Europe. Um, secondly, uh, we also have uh, the pleasure uh, to have a moderator. Um, the moderator of tonight is Brendan Donnelly. Uh, Brendan Donnelly is uh, the director for the Fed, from the Federal Trust for Education and Research. So he will be chairing uh, this, this event. Um, he knows Europe very well, since he has been a member of the European Parliament between, between 94 and 99. Um, but that's not all. He has been studying at Oxford. He has worked for the Foreign Office uh, and he has worked for the European Commission as well. So we think he's the ideal man um, to help us through this evening, uh, through this afternoon um, on consensual debating, on debate, on, 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 on Europe. Um, so we're very happy and pleased that he's joining us. Um, before I pass the words to him, just a, a quick word on how this event will go. Um, so we have this brief introduction part, um, and then the whole event is being split up in two parts. So first, we will really go into the theory, what's consensual debating. Um, so Tony Czarnetsky is the best person to explain us all that. Um, afterwards, we give the floor to you. Uh, so you will be able to ask all the questions you want. Uh, you can write them in the chat and then Brandon Donnelly, he's going to uh, give you the word so you can unmute yourself. As you see, you all come in um, muted to this to this event, but you can unmute yourself then if Brandon gives you the word to interact in person. Uh, we want to make this as interactive as, as possible. And then in the second part of the event, uh, we will go into the, into the practical part. Um, and then we will really try out like how does this consensual debating work. We will go into a concrete statement on citizen chambers um, and we will look into that together and test it out. Um, but that's it for me. Um, I will give you uh, to uh, Brendan Donnelly. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, and thank you very much um, for Tony. 
Uh, I, we're looking forward at the Federal Trust to working in the coming months and years with both of you. And it seems there's a considerable overlap between your interests and ours. The Federal Trust is a uh, think tank based in London, uh, particularly a, a pro-EU think tank. Um, uh, federalism is, is uh, the name of our, our, our underlying philosophy. And obviously the European Union is a, a very good and, and if not perfectly developed um, manifestation of, of federalist philosophy. Uh, today, um, as um, Thomas has told you, we're going to start with a, a presentation by Tony of the, um, uh, of the, the concept of, of, of consensual debating. And uh, this seems to me to be a, a philosophy that has wide general application, uh, obviously in Europe, but uh, if I think about the debate that we've had in, in this country, in the United Kingdom, uh, about COVID and the response to it, uh, then a little bit of consensual debating on that wouldn't have come amiss. Um, the, the, the issue is often presented as being an absolute choice uh, between everybody staying at home in a mask uh, and not going out and not having any social or economic life whatsoever, or everybody having the right to go to a nightclub and uh, watch a football match um, uh, uh, at, their, uh, uh, at their discretion. Uh, without any any public health considerations. So I'm looking forward very much to, to, to learning from what Tony has to say to us, um, and then we'll get the questions coming afterwards, um, and then we're going to have a, a worked example. So we'll, we'll find out whether the philosophy works or not. Um, I warn you, Tony, I've looked at the participants, and there are some um, pretty bolshy characters who are going to be there. So if you can get a consensus from them, you're doing pretty well. Tony, Thank when you, I said uh, Bolshevik, of course, I didn't mean that critically. I meant that as a compliment. Um, very uh, determined people, I should have said. Yes. Thank you, Brendan, for such a cheerful introduction. I, I hope I'll meet your expectation and everybody else. Yes, it is a challenge to introduce you to an entirely new concept of how can we debate very complex issues in a consensual way. Uh, so this is the title of my presentation, Consensual Debating for Citizens' Assemblies. Uh, although we could, we could discuss this subject in uh, a much broader context, I have focused on the Conference on the Future of Europe, because that's where the citizens' assemblies are being applied really in earnest. So let me introduce you to the agenda, which has three points. I will start with justifying the need for consensual debating. And then I'll move on to show you how the consensual debating helps achieve not just 50% majority, but 60% majority, and it can do it very quickly. And following that, I'll probably focus on what may be for most of you the most interesting part, how this can have a significant impact on the wider adoption of consensual de uh, debating in, in, in politics. And as Brenda said, there will be a, a question and answer session and a live online consensual debating on citizens' assembly is more representative than an electoral, electoral system. Obviously, this is a provocative statement, but it's meant to be so that we can achieve consensus even on something like this. So what is the need for consensual debating? I think all of us, even if you are not uh, British, remember the British referendum on Brexit in June 2016, which is just five years ago. We just presented with a ballot like this, and those who were for Remain, as myself, gained just 48% support. And the rest, the Leavers won 52%, and here we are with Brexit. And now you can ask yourself, if we are really pressed with having a referendum to sort this out, should have been done in that way. At the time of referendum, there were already people saying that there should have been more than one option. And I entirely agree. So what I would suggest to consider is that if a referendum really is to be done, since we have now um, immensely powerful digital support for such like this, something like this, we should use it. We should, for instance, extend the referendum over three months and allow the people to re-vote after they've seen what is happening 
and then present several options and adopt the single transferable voting system. So for instance, we will have six options. Remain a member of the European Union, leave, no ECGA jurisdiction, which we actually have, which is the very hard Brexit, leave single market, single market only, customs union, or Norwegian model. Of course, it didn't happen. It's, it's just um, a reflection on how it might have been. So we need some, something better to make complex political decisions. In Ireland, at almost the same time, they were deciding uh, a very, very important issue for them, same-sex marriage and abortion. And they said, well, let's have a referendum. But actually, they didn't do that because they said, hold on, why not to try citizens' assembly first? and then have a referendum. And that's precisely what happened. I will talk about it later on, uh, but since I've touched on the Citizens' Assembly, I don't want to um, develop the subject too broadly, but only in the context of today's debate. So what is it? What are Citizens' Assemblies for? First of all, as I have already alluded to, um, they are used to debate constitutional matters to get a meaningful consensus. Um, they could be a substitute for a referenda, although even in Ireland they were not. It, were, it was followed by a referendum. And they can be used to debate broad policy objectives like climate change or health service. So how do they work? Well. We need to go two and a half thousand years back to uh, Pericles' Agora, where they were faced with the problem that we are facing today uh, as well, corrupt politics. So they wanted the 300,000 Athenians to have a say, direct say, on how to do the politics, to make decisions. Obviously, women, I, I'm sorry, we asked a few ladies here, women didn't count at that time, so only men were elected, around 50,000 of them, 6,000 showed up at Agora on average and uh, debated at, at Pnix. Uh, so that's how it started, and Roman liked it so much that they based a jury service on it. And <laughs> anybody that has lived in any Anglo-Saxon country knows that the jury service is well, practice in, in most Anglo-Saxon um, jurisdictions. Um, in the UK, for instance, we have uh, 12 people to decide on uh, whether a person is guilty or not. But the people, and that's why I'm mentioning it, the people for that jury service are selected randomly from electoral list. Moreover, they, are, they have to do it. They, they, they must have really serious excuses not, not to serve on the jury. So a similar random selected uh, system is applied for citizens' assemblies, although it's not yet compulsory. I don't know if it, ever, it is ever going to be compulsory. Um, and they uh, select around from 50 to 300 people, depending <clears throat> how important the issue is and how large is the country. In Ireland, there were 100 people. <clears throat> In the Conference on the Future of Europe, of which we'll be talking about, there are around 200 people in each uh, Citizens' Assembly. It has three stages. In the first one, the delegates just learn from the experts and through self-study what, what the subject matter is about, and then deliberate, uh, uh, deliberate among themselves, confronting each other's views and learning from each other. And finally, there is a decision-making process. It usually takes a few weekends, probably four weekends on average is the, the right time. And then the decision, if it is to make any impact on a society, should be followed by a binding vote in the parliament. And that's the key aspect of uh, citizen assembly that is still being discussed and only in very few examples it was uh, followed by a binding vote. It has been practiced all over the world. I am only highlighting the, the most uh, important ones. 
So, citizens' assemblies are now applied for the Conference on the Future of Europe. Now, I don't want to talk about the conference itself because I would have run out of time, but I am going to show you how citizens' assemblies fit into that 10 months long conference, which is to end in March, in spring uh, next year. So the decision-making body is a conference plenary consisting of 433 members. We have three member executive board, three members from the European Commission, 54 members from the European Council, that means two representatives of each country, 108 members from the European Parliament, that means four uh, representatives of each country. Um, we have national parliaments, again, for the very first time in the European Union, the national parliaments are uh, directly engage into possibly setting up the European law. There are 108 of them. There are some 80 members of your social partners, the regions, 34, and then come this National Citizens' Assembly. And this is an absolute new form because in every European country, there is a National Assembly which, uh, for which people are randomly selected and two people from this, uh, from such an assembly uh, are being selected to the European Citizens' Assembly, which will have altogether 108 members. And what has been fought for nearly two years by those, let's put it, uh, laggards in the European Union was that, yes, you can have Citizens' Assembly, so let them talk, but no way in no way they will be making any decision on the future of Europe. Just two days before the launching of the uh, conference on the 9th of May this year, the whole conference hang in balance because 16 countries opposed that. But finally they did agree. So we have a major, major uh, happening now in, in Europe, a real happening in, in every European country and we shall see what the, uh, the debate will come up with. Anyway, the genie is, uh, genie is out of the bottle. So watch this space. And that's why we are talking today about the citizens' assemblies. Now, people can not just discuss European issues within the citizens' assemblies. Uh, the European Union has created the, uh, for the coffee uh, conference a special digital platform, uh, which on the 19th of May, so just 10 days after, had already over 13,000 participants, 3,500 ideas, 500 events and so on. It's now going into the 20,000 participants and thousands of events. This is a mega, mega event. So any, but any citizen can participate in this debate, including anyone uh, from outside the European Union, because this is the conference on the future of Europe, not on the European Union. So those uh, British people who are here are very much welcome to participate in this debate, as I have been doing. Um, but the problem only is, how can you um, enable tens of thousands of participants debate thousands of ideas simultaneously. Here, in my view, the European Union has done something very, very good, but I'll tell you in, in a moment um, about that, because we have to come back to the citizens' assemblies, how the citizens' assemblies generally handle the debates. And they handle it using uh, the concept of focus groups. And uh, to enable that, they use paper, yellow stickers. Everybody probably have seen the yellow stickers, but not how they use for political debates. So imagine that you are in a big room and there are say 50 people or so, because that's uh, maybe 30 to 50 people. And you put, uh, there is a, there is a, a motion and then people put their statements on the board. 
And depending how aligned these statements are with the major uh, boat, with the major motion, they are put on, on the left or the right side of the board. And after a while, usually this is being done just in a day or two, um, these statements, not the people, the statements are grouped together for similarities and the green uh, sticker is put on top of that. But they're then grouped in a very broad group, which is for against the issue. And that's how the focus group works. Now, the problem with this is because one may think, well, okay, let's use it for citizens assemblies or, or for the platform. You can do that. First of all, it's very slow and difficult to manage. 50 people is absolute maximum. And the second one is, if, is that uh, it can only be done in a physical location, say in a room. And it's limiting, it, as I said, to tens of people, whereas citizens assemblies, uh, the coffee conference have over 200 delegates. So what next? We have to do something better for coffee and the European Union has come up with a very innovative approach, which I call reply and endorse. And what it is, it is, um, and this is an extract, a live extract from the current debate on one of, of, a f of several thousand topics. It's had a truly European elections, transnational EU wide electoralist. And the gentleman that put it up describes it here in, 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 in bold. And then people put comments on it. These are called replies in various languages. Believe it or not, they can put these comments in 24 languages and they are immediately translated into English or whatever language you want. It's absolutely impressive. So uh, the system can handle tens of thousands of participants, tens, uh, thousands of topics. It's very seamless and once a month, there are going to be consolidated, I think the first report has already been produced, consolidated report with some so-called data mining and manual review. So you think that everything is well? Well, well, not so well. Because if you think about this, this is a, essentially an endorse or abstain choice, similar to making a decision in a referendum. So we haven't gone uh, too far in what we want. The most important thing is that the replies are confusing because you can reply to a person here, but you can also reply to one of these guys. And if this happens, you don't know whether you are endorsing the main statement or one of these replies. Um, comments are very, very long uh, the limit is 300, uh, 3,000 um, characters, which is over a page, sometimes even longer. Uh, and most importantly, they are with, without a context. And if you go and look at the topics, you can see that many of these topics, the main topics, repeat itself, or they are worded slightly different. They try to align them, but it is very, very, very difficult, so that some improvement is needed. So how can you make it better? Has anybody heard about police? I'm sure you have, because you think about the name in Greek for a city, which it is. But in this case, it's a debating uh, system created by young um, Turks, uh, Americans in 2012, um, researchers statisticians and mathematicians, and they've done really a very interesting thing. Um, what it does, it actually, it has digitized the concept of yellow stickers. So it enables immediately tens of thousands or even millions of people to debate in a consensual way remotely via a platform, like the platform on, uh, uh, for the coffee conference. Um, participants, and this is very important, um, participants debate indirectly via statements, not with persons. And they do that because 
the voting is anonymous. You don't know who has voted as, as, as you read the vote, read the statement. Um, so that gives a tremendous flexibility and um, makes debates much more fruitful and open. And of, of course, you are, you are able to revote again, uh, unlike in focus group. Uh, they can participate, uh, supplement their own statements, tens of thousands of people. What is, in, is significant here that the debate can last many months, like here in the European Union, 10 months, but the actual time spent on making decisions is just a few days, maybe a day or two. And that's where the significance of that kind of debating uh, has to be appreciated. Um, there are live uh, graphics showing how participants view change and I'll, I'll show you later on has been used in, in Australia, Canada and even in the United Kingdom by the uh, Demos uh, polling company. However, Polis has one problem here. It's an exponential improvement on what we have had to our disposal so far but it may be inadequate for complex debates such as constitution and Brexit because it still sees problems in silos. It can see a, a broader context and in complex debates, this is very, very important. So that's why we come to consensus debating. What we have done uh, at Sustensis, uh, we have created um, our own structured content debating um, several years before, before creating consensus debating. And when we've discovered polis, we combined polis with our structured content debating, creating consensual debating. So what it is in, in a nutshell, that it extends the capabilities of polis by still almost forcing participants to focus on the narrow subject of the debate, but at the same time being aware of a wider context. Secondly, it provides, and this is very important, it provides short, medium and extensive description of each statement. So you know what is what you are talking about, what is the subject matter, and you can start with a very short description and then you want more information and go further on until you, 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 you find pages and pages describing the subject matter. Uh, the second thing that we have created, we have created a special type of a website. You probably haven't come across this type of website, uh, which supports the whole consensus debating, uh, which is supported by Euro Agora. Now, at the moment, Euro Agora supports the uh, European uh, conference, but it can support anything. You can just flush it out and supplement with entirely different subject in politics, science, or technology. So what do you do? How do you start? First of all, you register at this address and we'll do it at the end. Um, and once you've registered, you, you should really come and um, review the overall context. So what is the context? I think the best way to talk about consensus debating is to compare the subject matter to reading a book. If you open a book on say third, fourth page, you find the table of contents and you find chapters like say values and responsibilities, consensus of democracy or citizens assemblies. And in Euragora, you follow a very similar script. So the chapters of a book become the top tabs in Euragora. And uh, they are developed in a logical order. So from left to right, you get more and more detail, like in a book. The other specific thing is that each such tab has two subtabs, info, which is about the information, and police, which is about voting. So for instance, in this case, which we will be the debating, 
The info tab contains basic information on citizens' assemblies. And it contains subtabs on various statements. We will be debating statement 42. So that's how it works in general uh, in terms of an overview. Once you familiarize yourself with, with the overall context where the citizens' assemblies actually uh, come in, then you read the information, specific information on what are citizens' assemblies. And then you start debating by clicking on uh, statement 42, like citizens' assembly is more represented in an electoral system. Now, once you familiarize yourself with the subject matter, you come to the voting uh, pages. So this is what, what you will see. You will see the statement like this, and you will see three options. You can agree, disagree, or if you're unsure, you click on this. But, and this is an important thing, by the way, this is just one of many statements. As you can see, in this case, there are nine more statements remaining on which you will be uh, requested to vote. But you may say, okay, I broadly agree with this, but there is something missing, or I would like some caveats attached. So what you can do, you can add your own statement. But it's a very short one, just 140 characters, like these statements are here. And this is for the reason that people don't have to spend days reading somebody else's uh, view, viewpoints. You have to be succinct. You may have your own idea, what you, what you want to put for voting by others. But if you run out of ideas, you can always go here, which is a text above that, which is a en slightly enlarged text. And you can copy a sentence from the text and put it in here. It's very easy. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel, if you like, because you say, oh, okay, I like this sentence and I like to make it a statement. And that's how the voting goes. So the fifth step is that you follow the voting results as they change. This is the initial position. There are three groups because the whole um, police system works on the um, assumption that people think similarly. They may not express their ideas in identical way, but they think similarly. And there is an almost like an artificial intelligence pattern behind it, although this is not strictly speaking AI. The position changes in time. And if it, if it uh, goes on for weeks, it will change many, many times. And so will be these groups. So over time, from these three groups, you may have just two. So then you have to come to perhaps a very puzzling thing, which is called 60% majority. How about that? Well, let's take our statement 42. This is the original one and people voted on it. 14 people voted overall, 11 have been grouped in group A and three in group B. And there are four statements on which there is at least 60% agreement. Now, many people, I think most of the people would immediately think, ah, 60% of people agree with the original statement. Wow. Be surprised, it's not like that. These are the, original, the, the additional statements by the people uh, who voted, and, and they are overall here. But as you can see in red, 70% of the people, so also the qualifying majority, didn't support one of the sentences. So what the majority is, is about grouping people who have very similar opinion, but not necessarily agreeing with the heading, right? So that's how the majority is formed. 
So let me now move into the implications of wider implications of adopting this consensus debating on politics. I think it, it can dramatically change the nature of most debates by eliminating adversarial nature of such of some debates. Uh, as you can see, everybody can have the, exactly the same amount for debate. No one is excluded. Nobody knows how you voted. Each vote is anonymous, like during the election. The minority view is included, as I have shown you. So that has to be taken into account when you, when you summarize, if I, if I go back, because these statements, okay, this is, this is, yeah, this could be a serious thing. These four statements would form a, a part of policies or even articles of, um, of an act of parliament. And if this uh, contrarian statement is there, that has to be somehow accommodated. And that's the beauty of it. And that's what consensus is about. Majority shouldn't trample the minority. And that's the nature of consensus. And this would help healing relations between people and politicians. But how can we expand this into improving democracy? So far, we have been discussing how it can be applied for citizens' assemblies as a kind of a one-off deliberation on important matters. But how about if we have the European Union Citizens' Chamber to continuously scrutinize the current MPs Chamber of the Parliament? So if we assume that it is possible, and I'm almost certain that such a proposal will actually make it to the uh, uh, conference plenary and will be debated, then what would happen? Imagine that these delegates are randomly selected from all European countries, and they would be able to vote anonymously on a subject like this, which again, I'm pretty sure, actually this is one of the topics that has gained most support so far. Let's say that we are debating that motion that we want a single president for the European Union. So we would have a legislation proposal, say of 5th of September next year, then on 10th of September, the supporting office would cut this proposal into individual statements, very short one, like say 140 characters. And then the delegates would vote on each statement over a one and a half month time. And then on the 4th of uh, November, at citizen chamber results uh, of the session would have been, would be revealed. The whole process of approving such a motion would take at most two months but effectively only two days. So this is how we could change our democracy, but we could impact it even more than that. So we have representation of the uh, democracy, which we love, but we take politicians to account when we are at the ballot box. How about if we include direct democracy in the shape of the citizen chamber, where the delegates are elected randomly, independent of any parties, and serve just one parliamentary term. If we then merge these two concepts into one wider one, where MPs chamber proposes and sets up the loan, and the citizen chamber monitors and co-legislates, then what we will get is a new kind of democracy, consensual democracy. And this is my final slide. Uh, we have citizens' assemblies, which we uh, already covered, the citizens' chamber, but it can be also used in parliamentary committees. I call it pre-voting, where the MPs would anonymously vote 
on a motion in the parliamentary committee, not on the floor of the parliament. Because they, they would represent themselves. And in that way, they would show how, if they were only representing themselves, how the vote would go. And then they can vote revealing their own uh, preferences. The referenda could be substituted, local councils could use it, social and cultural organization. And I finish here, and I invite you to ask questions. And Brendan, take over the floor. Thank you.